Is Final Fantasy X in 2023 worth playing? Absolutely. This is one of the best traditional Final Fantasy games to date, and in fact, maybe the best in the series. However, a lot of aspects in this game are very dated and could really use a reworking, so let's talk about it. Final Fantasy X was released in 2001, 22 years ago, and for the time, this game made a lot of innovative changes to the Final Fantasy formula, and it was the first Final Fantasy title to be fully voice acted. It was received extremely well and is often placed amongst the greatest in the series, and to this date, is a lot of people's first Final Fantasy title and a lot of people's favorite Final Fantasy title. It was more recently released as Final Fantasy X slash X2 HD Remaster in 2013, where they bundled Final Fantasy X and Final Fantasy X2 together, gave the games a graphic overhaul, and improved the performances. This is the version of Final Fantasy X that I played for this video and the one that people will most likely play today seeing how accessible it is and how many platforms it's on. But 22 years and 10 years respectively are very long periods of time. A lot's changed over this time and new standards are developed. So the question is, how does this game hold up? Where does it thrive? And where does it falter? Plot and story. Okay, so right off the bat, there's going to be no spoilers in this section or for the next several sections to come, but I will have a spoiler section at the end of the video discussing the story with some detail and what I think of it. Here I'll just go over the plot and my general thoughts of the story as a whole. And again, no spoilers. So, the story is really, really good, but at times it's a bit confusing and hard to follow. The reason for this is somewhat intentional due to the mysterious nature of the circumstances that the main character Titus finds himself in, but it's also due to the poor localization of the script. Majority of the script is localized appropriately, but there are a decent amount of things that are kind of lost or changed from their original meanings, and at times this benefits the game, for the most part it hinders it. However, I've done a bit of research on this, and from playing the game through a couple times now, I believe they have a much better understanding of the story and the plot that I'll hop into much further in the spoiler section. But for now, let's talk about the general plot. So you start off the game as the main character, Titus, in a futuristic major metropolitan area called Xanarkin. Titus is a famous blitzball player, which is essentially underwater soccer mixed with rugby. And he's on his way to a blitzball game while all of his fans are stopping him and asking for his autograph. During the match, chaos erupts and the city starts getting destroyed by an unknown force and fiends start appearing out of seemingly thin air. Also appearing out of seemingly thin air, we have our second main character and main party member, Orin. Orin shows up to help Titus get through the fiends and get to safety, or at least seemingly so. After wheeling through the fiends, Titus and Orin get caught in the grasp of a thing or a creature that is sucking them up into the sky that they cannot get away from. Disturbingly calm, Orin tells Titus, this is your story, which at the time doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but this is a very important phrase that we'll revisit later on in this video. And with a flash of light and both characters becoming fully engulfed by this entity, the scene ends. This is a wonderful opening that sets the tone of this game, it's very engaging, and it sets up the mystery as well. Right after this, Titus finds himself alone and in a foreign area. He's stuck in some ancient ruins after an unfortunate meeting with a pretty powerful underwater fiend. That is until another main character shows up with her crew out of pure coincidence while she's also exploring the same ruins. During which she rescues Titus and through some more unfortunate events with the same creature that seemingly brought them into the foreign land, Titus gets separated from his crew and washed ashore to another foreign area known as Besaid. Here he meets four other main characters and party members, Waka, Lulu, Kamari, and Yuna. From these events, Titus learns that the creature that brought him here is known as Sin, and it basically goes around the world destroying places for some unknown reason, and Yuna, who is a summoner, is going on a pilgrimage which is designed for her to gather strength and aeons, which is this game summons, which will make her strong enough to defeat the creature called Sin. Also through these events, Titus learns that somehow, Sin not only destroyed his home of Xanarkin, but Sin also did this a thousand years ago. So somehow, Sin has sent Titus to another version of reality, or Sin has sent Titus a thousand years into the future, or something of that nature. So with being new to this world, and its people, and not really knowing what to do, Titus gets the opportunity to join Yuna and her guardians Waka, Lulu, and Kamari to accompany her and protect her on her journey to defeat Sin, to which he accepts and sets sail on their adventure. The setup with this mystery and all the other mysteries of this world is done so well here and really helps drive forward the story. And I want to take my time exploring this mystery and the lore of this game and touch on a little bit more in another section along with some other very interesting aspects about this game in the spoiler section but overall the opening the beginning sections and the plot is just very very solid you know what else is very very solid the soundtrack and visuals the visuals in this game are really great especially considering that this is a 22 year old game I played on the HD remastered version of this game on a PS5, which was made in 2013, so this version is only 10 years old, but the remastered version is not a remake. 
So the graphics and designs were just up and slightly tweaked respectively. But regardless of that, it still looks great to this day. However, I do think in terms of remasters, this is a bare minimum one. A lot of things have stayed the same from the original, with just minimal advancements, but I'll go into more detail on that a little bit later. But design-wise, graphically, and cutscene-wise, the game still holds up pretty well today. It by no means is one of the best looking games to date, but it absolutely holds its own and doesn't feel so outdated that the quality of the graphics will reduce your enjoyment of this title. And a big reason for this is the art design. The art design for this game is just amazing. It's essentially a mix of futuristic tech-inspired pieces with very traditional island-style culture pieces. There's also a ton of religious-inspired pieces that kind of reflect the religious beliefs of Yevon, which I'll get into a little bit later, along with some super interesting and cool monster and summon designs. The soundtrack is also amazing. This is a top-tier Final Fantasy soundtrack through and through. This is my second favorite mainline Final Fantasy soundtrack, just behind Final Fantasy XIII. While playing the HD remastered version, you have the choice of either picking the original soundtrack or the arranged soundtrack. Both are great in their own terms, but the arranged soundtrack more or less fits the situation and the circumstances that you'll find yourself in throughout the game a little bit better than the original. This version basically takes some of the original tracks and either remixes them, makes audio balances, or makes audio enhancements to these tracks, or all three. Therefore, I'd say pick the arranged version because it's probably the superior version, but you can't go wrong with the original either. And in all honesty, the arranged version is very similar to the original, so either way, it's a pretty similar experience. There's such a wide variety of tracks as well, and they really do a great job at fitting the tone of the places or the situations that you're in at the time, and some are absolute bangers as well. Overall, the visuals and the soundtrack for Final Fantasy X, wonderful. The characters and lore. No major spoilers. This is Titus' story. He's the main character, and you'll be playing as him throughout the entire game, with the exception of one or two sections. And honestly, I think he's a great main character. For the most part, he's pretty positive, good to a fault, driven, talented, but he does have daddy issues, and I'll talk more about that in the spoiler section. Again, at the beginning of the game, he swept away from his home, which is Anarchan, to either a new world or reality or a thousand years in the future. And like Titus, we're introduced to this new world spirit as he is. But essentially Spira, which is the name for the world of the game, is a world torn apart by sin and put back together by its people. Sin terrorizes the world due to the creature being able to show up really at any time and completely annihilate almost anything at once. But again, of course, the people fight back against this, and the main way of fighting back is by becoming a summoner and going on a pilgrimage to stop sin, which is where the second main character comes into the story, Yuna. Yuna is a wonderful supporting main character. She's very kind, selfless, feminine, and caring. She really wants to bring peace to her people and to the world of spirit as a whole, just like her father did before her. Her father was the summoner directly before her that successfully defeated Sin, which led Spira into a period known as the Calm. The Calm is a 10 year period where Sin just doesn't exist after it's been bested. But after this period, Sin comes back to terrorize the people of Spira. So Yuna's on a mission to make her pilgrimage and defeat Sin, just like her father did. But Yuna can't make this pilgrimage alone. She needs her guardians, like Waka. Waka's not only one of the first characters that Titus meets in Spira, but he's also one of Yuna's original guardians. He's very friendly, positive, full of energy, spunky, outspoken, airheaded, blunt, and faithful. He's also a Blitzball player, just like Titus, so this immediately connects the two. But primarily, he's a true follower of Yevon, the religious teachings of Spira. Yevon's teachings mostly revolve around certain aspects of sin. The religion believes that sin is essentially an accumulation of all the prior world's sins, that being the world that Titus belongs to, along with the sins of today, which is primarily the use of machines, or machina as termed in this version of Spira, for pretty much anything. Thus the world of Spira reflects these beliefs, with most things and places lacking any form of significant technology associated with it, in fear of going against Yevon's teachings, and also in fear of attracting sin to this technology, or machina. Well, that is with the exception of the Albed, to whom Riku belongs. Riku is actually the first character that Titus meets in this new spear, during which she rescues him from being trapped in some underwater ruins and then is quickly separated from Titus due to sin interfering. But Riku is a very lively, energetic, naive, happy, fun, and friendly character that is also very caring and loving. As mentioned, she's part of the Albed race, which not only goes against Yevon's teachings by using Machina extensively, but the Albed also lives separately from most of the lands that Yevon has influence on, and they speak a different language that even you as the player can't read or understand. Well, that is in the beginning anyway. Throughout the journey, you can find Albad ciphers, which will decipher certain letters of the Albad language into the language that you're playing the game in. But as you can imagine, with Waka being a firm believer in Yemen and its teachings, he's not much of a fan of the Albad, which I'll talk more about this in the spoiler section as well. But thankfully, Lulu's there to help out with his dilemma. 
Lulu is one of Yuna's original guardians that you also meet in Besaid alongside Waka. And it's all too evident that her and Waka not only are friends, but they've also been friends for a while and have some sort of history together. Her and Waka are close, and she keeps him in check in almost every way possible. As far as Lulu goes, she's the badass female archetype mixed with a goth girl persona. She's grumpy, straightforward, tough, but she's also loyal and caring in her own way. Whereas someone like Yuna or Riku would show and tell their feelings, Lulu only shows her feelings by her actions through sticking with Yuna and taking care of Waka and even helping out Titus at times. She's a wonderful character. And for the final original guardian, we have Kamari. He's a Ronso, which is like a cat-like humanoid creature that has a horn on their foreheads. But Kamara is very much a silent character or a reserved character in general. He's very stoic, strong, protective, and brave. And he's actually Yuna's first guardian. And there's a lot of backstory to this that's really great overall. And I think he's a really cool character to have in your party. And for the final main character that we have in the party, we have Orin. Orin is by far the coolest character in the game. And for sure one of the best Final Fantasy characters of all time. He's very stoic, speaks confidently, but only says what needs to be said. He's strong and just a total badass through and through. He's very much like a wise, stoic samurai type. But he also has a lot of emotional and important moments throughout the story as well. And he definitely knows more about what's going on in the larger scheme of things and only reveals this information during the right time, which is also super cool. Phenomenal character. If you've played through the game before, there's obviously some characters and aspects about the world and the lore that I've neglected to put in this section, but I'll talk about those in the spoiler section. But for now, let's talk about the best aspect of this Final Fantasy title. The battle system and gameplay. So this battle system is by far the main aspect of gameplay that is most interesting and really what you'll be doing most of the time when you play this game. Yet there are some really interesting things to discuss when it comes to all the systems around these battles, like how you get from place to place and how the battles start and the save system and the consequences for not saving often. But basically throughout Final Fantasy X, you'll either be jogging or swimming from one area to another, having to deal with random enemy encounters after you take an algorithmically determined amount of steps and after you complete the battle, you move on with your journey from point A to point B. If all the party members on the field get KO'd in the fight, then you have to restart from the last save. Saving essentially works by a checkpoint system where you have to interact with these objects, known as save spheres, with these makeshift checkpoint areas that are placed all around the world of spirit. But due to this checkpointing system, you really have to plan out your routes and you have to make sure that you're prepared for these random encounters and potentially for getting into a major fight at the end of your destination. But speaking of fighting, let's hop into the battle system. This is absolutely a turn-based RPG through and through. But what makes this system very interesting is that it's actually a conditional turn-based battle system. But what does that mean? Well, effectively, you see the turn order of not only your party members, but the enemy's party members as well. And you can influence the turn order by performing certain actions or commands. The effects of these actions will be shown to you in the battle timeline on the right side of the screen. And unlike prior Final Fantasy titles, there's no time limit in which these commands need to be made. And again, this is a traditional turn-based system in the respect to where you choose commands, perform these commands, and then the enemies perform their commands. And then it's back to you. But really, how do all of these commands work? So at any given time, you can have up to three of your party members with you in a fight. That is, if you have three party members to fight with. And again, turn-based RPG. So all these characters will have their own turn, which is already set at the beginning of the battle, along with the enemy's turn orders that you are fighting. Once it's your character's turn, you can select a command from various different commands that's specific for each character. However, every character does have the standard commands of like attack and use items and etc. But a decent number of characters will not function effectively doing simple commands. For instance, Yuna is a healer and a summoner. Her physical attacks are very weak, but she's the only character that can heal the party, at least at the beginning of the game. And she can also summon her Aeons, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Lulu is essentially a black mage, and her physical attacks are also very weak. But she can cast magic spells and does a hefty amount of damage when enemies are either vulnerable to magic or just weak in general. Riku's a bit of a strange character because she's basically the thief archetype. Her physical attacks are typically pretty weak, but she can steal items from the enemies, which sometimes can be very valuable, or if the enemy is vulnerable to steal, she can one-hit KO them. She can also use a lot of very valuable items in battle that the other party members can't, at least at the beginning. Kimari is also a strange one in the sense that he's more moldable into whatever character type that you want him to go into, while not being quite as effective as the party member that's kind of designated to that role. However, he does have a lot of very specific moves that can be very helpful in particular situations. Tidus, Waka, and Arn are primarily physical damage dealers, with Tidus being more effective for fast enemies, Waka more effective against flying enemies, and Orn more effective against thick enemies, or enemies with a lot of defense. This balance of party members is really great here in Final Fantasy X, but only because the balance of enemies is also great. You will have several fights that require you to switch party members in and out of battle, which you can do freely by the way, with no penalties, in order to best the said enemy and win the battle. And even though a large portion of the battles will be three on three, where you have three party members against three different enemies, where each enemy essentially has a character on your 
team that is designed to take that enemy out, there's still a huge incentive for you to get all the team members in the battle because only the characters that participate in battle, meaning the characters that perform a command in the battle, will receive experience point from the battle, which is then used to level up. If you stick to mainly using the three party members that are most effective in respective battles, you will probably have a significant amount of party members that are under leveled by the time you get to a major boss fight where you're going to need all those party members to win the fight. And again, if you lose the fight, you'll be met with a game over screen and you'll have to start the game again from your last save. So you lose a ton of time and a lot of progress with this. So there's that risk benefit reward with saving time by most efficiently taking down the battle or spending a little bit more time and evenly leveling out the characters. So therefore there's kind of a micromanaging system in place here that encourages you to not only engage with every party member for most fights, but also teaches you about character specific traits and abilities that make them more useful for normal fights and also gives you an idea of how you want to tackle a really hard fight because you're familiar with all characters. But this also makes normal fights a little bit tougher as well, because in order to get all members into the fight, several members are probably going to take damage. And after these battles, you don't automatically heal. So the only way to heal is by either using healing items, which are limited, white magic spells, which cost MP points, which is also limited, or at save spheres, which is essentially checkpoints, which are also kind of spread out as well. But one good thing about taking damage, well, initially anyway, is that this fills up the party member's overdrive meter. Overdrive is essentially a limit break that allows the party member to unleash a significant amount of damage, typically, when the overdrive is filled up. And again, typically these overdrives can be very high damaging moves with certain characters. They can have very specific and unique overdrives that might heal the party significantly, that might buff the party significantly, or might debuff the enemies. Throughout your journey, more overdrives can be learned as your characters develop, and different methods of filling up the overdrive meter can also be learned. And although most aspects of this battle system are relatively simple in concept, there are so many of these concepts that all come to play in the battle system at the same time, the system becomes really engaging and fun, and is often remarked as one of the best battle systems in Final Fantasy history, to which I have to agree on, but I haven't talked about my favorite, and really I think the best part of the battle system, which are the summons, or in this game, referred to as Aeons. So summons are some of the coolest aspects of a Final Fantasy game, in my opinion, and I really think they're a staple of what a Final Fantasy game is at its core. Summons always look cool in Final Fantasy games, but they're all over the place in terms of usefulness from one Final Fantasy title to the next. In Final Fantasy 13, the summons were practically useless, while in Final Fantasy 15, the summons were very overpowered. And in Final Fantasy 16, summons take on their own form of gameplay, so that's completely different. But here in Final Fantasy 10, summons fulfill their own little niche within the battle system, and I think it's almost perfectly balanced. So once you meet Yuna and the crew in Besaid, you'll be granted your first Aeon, Balfour. And throughout the playthrough, you'll be granted four more Aeons, with three additional Aeons being available once you're able to explore the world of Spira freely. Each Aeon has a completely different moveset, and each one has their own strengths and weaknesses that have to be taken into consideration when being used in battle, and they can only be summoned by Yuna, and they can only be summoned one at a time. Once summoned, all their party members leave the battlefield, and the Aeon is the only party member that you have until the battle is finished, or if the Aeon perishes, or until you dismiss the Aeon. Once again, you have full control over the Aeon, but most Aeons are very slow, and typically the enemies will have more opportunities to attack the Aeon, but in exchange for the lack of agility, Aeons typically deal out more powerful attacks, and their overdrive meters fill up much more quickly. And speaking of overdrives, the Aeon's overdrives are so much stronger than the normal overdrives of your party members, and they play a much bigger role due to how quickly they fill up. These overdrives are very devastating, if you have several Aeons with these overdrives full, you can wipe out most enemies or make a huge blow to the enemies that you're fighting. But again, they're pretty slow, they can die easily, can only be revived and healed through save spheres. And for a lot of the big bosses, they have counters to these Aeons as well. So if you're not careful, you can lose these Aeons and thus lose a huge advantage in the fight. The Aeons are wonderfully balanced and a ton of fun to use. Oh, and all the overdrives and summons of the Aeons, meaning the summoning animation, visually magnificent. This battle system has a ton of simplistic concepts that all come together to make a really great battle system that's a ton of fun, engaging, and at times complex and challenging. But you know it's also at the same level of simplicity and quality as the battle system? The Sphere Grid. The Sphere Grid has to be the best leveling system that I've ever seen and used in not just a Final Fantasy game, but in any video game ever. But let me explain why this is so. As you go through the game, fight enemies, and defeat them in battle, any character that performed a command in battle will receive experience points and gain AP points once an experience threshold is crossed. You can look at this threshold at any time in the menu system, and it's shown to you at the end of every battle as you're rewarded the experience points for completing the battle. The AP points are then utilized in the Sphere Grid to move you from one node to another, and the number of nodes that you'll move is directly based on how many AP points that you have. So if you have two AP points, you can move two nodes. But what are these nodes and why are they important? 
The nodes on the sphere grid can be a lot of different things. They can be abilities that the character can gain, which are essentially their moves. They can be an HP node that increases the character's HP. They can be a strength node that increases the attack power of the character. They can be a magic node that increases the magic power of that character. They can be an MP node that increases the amount of MP that the character has. And they can be a lot of other status improving nodes or simply just empty nodes. However, if these nodes aren't empty nodes, in order to activate them, you have to have a specific item. For instance, if there's a new ability node, you need an ability sphere to activate it. And if there's there's a strength node, you need a power sphere to activate that one. But power spheres can also be used for defense increasing nodes. And for magic increasing nodes, you can use a mana sphere, which can also be used for magic defense increasing nodes. There are a lot of other spheres that you get later where some can change a blank node into a status node, spheres that can teleport you from anywhere on the sphere grid to another location on the sphere grid, spheres that can unlock locked off sections of the sphere grid, and some other funky spheres that do a variety of interesting things. But speaking of the sphere grid, let's talk about the structure of it. So the sphere grid for all party members is one very large grid system that is interconnected but each character starts off at a different location of the sphere grid and essentially has their own path through it however the sphere grid is interconnected and at certain points you can take a multitude of characters out of their own sections and into another character section thus giving the character that you're working on more attributes and abilities of the character sphere grid that you've invaded. This is best demonstrated with Kamari, which is basically a character that's intentionally designed to do this early on. His section of the sphere grid is very small and limited, but he gains access to the other character sphere grids almost immediately. His natural path is more so leaned towards following Lulu's sphere grid, which is definitely beneficial due to this basically giving you another black mage and the fact that his baseline magic stats are pretty high. But if you want, he can go into Waka's, Titus, or Riku's sphere grid almost as easily as he can go into Lose. But with a little more work, he can go into Unisphere Grid. And with even more work, he can go into Orin's Sphere Grid. Also, Lulu can get into Waka's section pretty early on as well. And Waka can get into Orin's section early on, and Orin can get into Titus's section early on. And then Titus can hop into Yuna's section early on, and Yuna can get into Riku's section early on. And then Riku can hop into Kamari's section early on. But with the exception of Kamari invading other characters' section early on, it's typically not beneficial. But doing it later on in the game, which by the way, there'll be a lot of opportunities throughout the Sphere Grid to do this, is very beneficial. The Sphere Grid is so expertly crafted in this way that there is a pretty standard line of progression for each character, but there's a lot of twists and turns throughout it that allow you to verge from the linear path and kind of go your own route or it'll have branches from the linear path that may or may not be beneficial to you there's also very powerful abilities or stats that are presented to you pretty early on that you can't get to due to them being locked behind a key node that you'll have to come back to and unlock it later or maybe you can unlock the level 4 key node by the time you reach it but you only have one level 4 key sphere and you can see that another character is about to run up on the same situation and maybe that character's ability is more useful than the character that you're on now or maybe you have a ton of AP points, but not enough spheres in general. So you're keeping some characters behind in the sphere grid, but you try to obtain more spheres to unlock the nodes in the sphere grid as not to waste the AP points. Or maybe you don't care about the stat upgrades and you want to get from one ability to the next. Even if you don't have enough spheres needed for the stat upgrades, you move past them right to the next ability node. Or maybe there's a side branch that has a level one key sphere block in it, but a ton of stats improving the nodes behind it. Or maybe there's also a really useful ability that's coming up soon and you're limited on AP points and the spheres at the moment and you know you're about to get into a difficult battle. So you go grind some more to get that ability. The interwovenness, the item management, and thoroughly thought out paths of each character, along with the pacing of the system, is just top tier. But speaking of items, what about the economic system of this game, along with the weapon system and the Aeon leveling? The economic system, weapon and armor system, and Aeon leveling. So let's start off with the simplest one of the three, and really the one that has a huge influence on the other two, the economic system. So what exactly do I mean by this? Well, I'm mostly referring to all the resources that you obtain throughout the game, which is mainly going to be either items or guild. And Gil is money for Final Fantasy titles. So for the most part, in this Final Fantasy title, the economic system is really well balanced. You end up having enough of these items, and you're not necessarily wanting for anything more. Unless, of course, you decide to neglect certain aspects of the gameplay that reward these items. And if you want the absolute best items in the game, you do have to grind for them a little bit. And neglecting certain aspects of this game is often enticing, because this may get you through a section of tap it quicker. Spheres are most likely the items that you'll need the most during the beginning of the game, as it halts your progression on the sphere grid. However, there are ways to get more specific kinds of spheres by using certain items or moves that make enemies drop those spheres. Yet in the later part of the game, you'll be hurting from not having enough gill for some of the really big purchases for top tier items or equipment. And if you want to level up your Aeons, they need a ton of items that do typically cost a lot, along with upgrading your weapons. But none of these aspects of the economic system are necessary for you to get through the main part of the game. They're just enhancements. But speaking of weapon upgrading and Aeon leveling, 
Aeon leveling is a skill that you'll be granted much later on throughout the story and allows Aeons to learn certain standard abilities that your party members have, or it increases their stats. You do this by attributing certain items in order to gain these status upgrades or to learn a certain ability. In theory, this is really cool. Each Aeon has a major weakness to some extent, and some Aeons become more or less useful as the game grows on. But each Aeon is absolutely a useful tool that you'll have at your disposal throughout the battles, so making them even more useful is obviously better. However, the amount of items that you need to level up the stats of the Aeon or regain an ability for that Aeon is pretty large and outrageous, and it's certainly an in-game endeavor. This sucks because this is a really cool idea, and like I mentioned, some of the early game Aeons become very weak towards the end of the game, so they are essentially only good for their overdrives or taking a massive blow that would be very detrimental to your party. And honestly, it's kind of the same situation for the weapons and armor too. So each party member has a weapon and an armor piece. Neither the weapon or the armor piece affects stats directly. However, both can have attributes associated with them that indirectly increase stats or give the character a special type of attack or defense. So each weapon and armor piece will have certain abilities attached to them that will ultimately determine their effectiveness in battle. Therefore, since neither piece of equipment directly affects the stats of a character, there's no traditional way of upgrading either piece of equipment. However, abilities can be added to equipment that have slots available for these abilities to be added to. But just like with Aeon upgrades, this takes a certain amount of items, which is typically pretty excessive. And especially early on, it's much more feasible just to wait to get a better piece of equipment than it is to put these abilities on a standard piece of equipment. Which I'm kind of okay with, because just trading out certain lesser pieces of equipment for better pieces of equipment is also kind of standard for leveling as well, and allows other aspects of this game to take priority, which I think is more important. But it would have been cool if this was balanced a little bit better. But I practically ignored this system throughout the playthrough. But there is a really big upgrade for the weapons as a whole, which is super cool, but it's also kind of annoying. And this is called the Celestial Weapons. So each party member has a celestial weapon that can be acquired later on in the game that is obviously the best weapon that that character can obtain. But unlike other weapons, each character's celestial weapon is very specific things that you must do in order to get them. However, once obtained, you need to get another item known as a crest to activate it, and then you need to get another item which is called a sigil to fully activate it. The crests are relatively simple in the sense that for the most part you just have to go find them, but the sigils require you to do some type of in-game mini-game activity. And the problem with this is that some of these are very, very difficult to do, along with being very time consuming. And pretty much all these mini games aren't particularly enjoyable either, so that kind of makes it worse. But if you really want to participate in the end game for Final Fantasy X, these weapons are very beneficial and pretty much necessary. So you're very much incentivized to get these weapons and activate them. And really the main reason why you want these weapons is because they allow you to break the damage limit, which is 9,999 damage. Meaning that without these weapons, each party member can only ever do 9,999 damage. But with these weapons, you can go past this limit, and theoretically to any number of magical. You can also craft this ability later on but again it requires a metric ton of a certain item that's really really rare and requires a lot of grinding to get so getting these celestial weapons are probably the more practical option but i'm telling you unless you want to engage with the end game don't get some of these celestial weapons some of these tasks for these weapons are just terrible and you really don't need them to beat the game and in fact they may actually trivialize the ending of the game I'm not gonna go over specifics for each one, but in general, Orin's Celestial Weapon is probably the easiest to obtain. It may honestly be worth it. Doesn't necessarily trivialize the game, like potentially Yunus does, which I'll talk about here in a second. It is relatively useful, as towards the end of the game, Orin could easily break the damage limit. Yunus, on the other hand, is probably the second easiest to get, and is by far the most useful. If you get Yunus at the end of the game, she'll probably become the most powerful damage dealing character, being more of a super healer. So this will probably trivialize the end for you. And if you wanna do that, you should do that. Kamari's isn't terrible either, but it's more difficult than the other two because of the mini game associated with it. And again, it's not a particularly fun mini game and it's relatively annoying. Riku's is a little bit more difficult to get as well, but the mini game isn't terrible, it's just more time consuming than anything else. And for Tidus, Waka, and Lulu, their weapons are horrible to obtain because all of the tasks of the mini games that you have to perform to get their sigils are either really difficult or just super annoying and time consuming. Tedious requires you to complete a chocobo race in a certain amount of time that is just super difficult. Waka's requires you to play a metric you know what ton of Blitzball and win. And Lulu has you dodging lightning strikes, which will require you to make a split second decision as a button press 200 times in a row without messing up once. For reference, if you did a perfect run of this, it would take you approximately one to one and a half hours of continuously dodging lightning strikes without getting struck once. If you get struck, of course you have to restart. This is insane. These last three are unbelievably ridiculous and things you would never find in a quality tile nowadays. They're definitely relics of the past. So although the Celestial weapons are really, really cool and super useful, attaining them all is really a drag for the most part, and you don't really need them if you're not gonna mess with the end game. But you know what else is a drag? Blitzball, the Cloister of Trials, and Chocobo Racing.
Blitzball is this Final Fantasy game's staple minigame that has been included with most mainline Final Fantasy titles prior to Final Fantasy X. And in theory, it's a really cool idea because it's essentially underwater soccer mixed with rugby, as I stated previously. But in Final Fantasy X, it's essentially another lesser version of the battle system that is significantly more random and super repetitive. It's heavily stat driven, and the only way to increase a player's stats is really just to use them more in Blitzball. And although this makes a lot of sense, Blitzball really isn't that fun and it's extremely time consuming. It's also not very rewarding in terms of items that you get during the matches, for completing the matches, with the exception, of course, of Waka's Celestial Weapon. But that requires you to play so much Bliss Ball and win, and really to me, it's really just not worth it. And some people love this mini game, but for me, there's really no redeeming qualities about it. And throughout the playthrough that I did for this video, I really didn't engage with it past the mandatory sections. And honestly, the same can be said about the Cloister of Trials. For every story mainline Aeon, you have to complete a puzzle dungeon, which is known as the Cloister of Trials. Every one of these trials is very inefficient, time consuming, non-intuitive at times, and really is not very enjoyable. But let me explain. So each Cloister of Trials has similar mechanics in the sense that the main thing that you'll be doing in each trial is finding a sphere or spheres and putting them in the appropriate places at the right time. And that's essentially it. However, every time you interact with a sphere, you are then presented with a menu that asks if you want to pick it up or do nothing with it. And then you have to choose which one you want to do. When there's only one or two spheres that you need, this isn't a big deal. But when you have six plus spheres that you have to find and then put in the right places in the right order, this can get really annoying. And on top of this, you can only carry one sphere at a time. If you come across another sphere that you might need later on, but you're already holding a sphere in your hand, you have to find a place to take the sphere in your hand and put it in. And then you have to go back to the previous sphere and pick it up. As far as the puzzle aspect of this goes, it's either super simplistic or really non-intuitive. When it's really simplistic, it's okay, but they added a ton of mechanics that make it extremely annoying that just kind of suck the fun out of it, and the puzzles as a whole are just not particularly good. And again, the non-intuitive additions to these puzzles just suck because you end up trying everything out and looking for crazy ideas of how this puzzle may be put together, and come to find out it's something you would have never thought of. But for this playthrough of this video, after the first couple of trials, I just started looking up everything and how to complete the trials as quickly as possible. And I'm very thankful that there's plenty of videos on this, because I really didn't want to deal with these past the first couple. And very similar to this, we have the Chocobo races. Chocobo Racing is a mini game that can reward you with some useful items, along with having a variety of different races and different levels of races. But in order to get Titus's Celestial Weapon, you need to complete the last race with a really good time that's very, very difficult to get. So if you want these rewards, you first have to get good, and you also have to get lucky. For the Chocobo Races in Final Fantasy XV, I found it to be fairly fun, primarily because of how the Chocobo is controlling the game. In Final Fantasy XV, these feathery steeds control extremely well, and you really felt like you had control over the Chocobo as it was moving. Absolutely not the case here in Final Fantasy 10. For these chocobo races, chocobo essentially moves forward without you controlling it, and you only really have control over the horizontal movements of the chocobo. But it's more like a tap in a horizontal direction, and a chocobo goes in a straight line in this direction until it can. But even then, for the first couple of races, the chocobo is fighting you pretty heavily, so it's even harder. But in the later races, you get more control over it, which makes it a little bit better. I think the chocobo races and the riding of the chocobo is supposed to mimic what it's like to train a horse, and then after you train it, what it's like to actually ride one. And that's all fine and dandy, but the way some of these next races are set up are just masochistic, really. For the last race, to complete the chocobo training, you have to beat it number one, and to get Titus's celestial weapon, you have to beat it with a time of 0.00 seconds. And for this race, they added birds that will come diving down from the sky that will hit you while you're on your chocobo and stop you right in your tracks for two seconds. And they also added balloons that will take time off your final time of the race. And they added an opponent that you have to beat in this race that'll take some of these balloons. But the wild part is, each race has its own set of birds, its own opponent behavior, and balloon placement. So sometimes these birds aren't too bad, and your opponent is a little slow and misses a lot of the balloons, and the placement of the balloons is very solid as well. But at other times, the birds are terrible, and your opponent is a pro at taking all these balloons, and for some of the races, the balloon placement is just way out of your way, and you're better off not getting them, so that can be kind of trippy too. Most of all these races are pretty difficult, but this last one raises the bar of difficulty significantly. And again, to get Titus's Celestial Weapon, you have to hit a time of 0.00 seconds. So essentially, you need to have a run where you don't get hit by any birds, which there's a ton of, hope the opponent is less aggressive than normal, that way you can get enough balloons to drop your time down to 0.00 seconds, and then also have an ideal balloon placement that allows you again to get enough balloons to get a 0.00 second finish time. However, the birds are super difficult to dodge, the balloon placement can be crazy, and the opponent can really screw you over as well. But there's some balloon placements, which there are about five different setups 
setups that the bowling placements can have in terms of overall setups that you literally cannot win with. So if you get this placement, you just have to complete the run and try it again. Because even if you had a perfect run, you're not gonna win. This is really, really rough and it just sucks that the Celestial Weapon for Titus is tied behind this challenge. I personally tried this mini game for about three hours and I got as close as you possibly could get without getting that 0.00 second time finish. Mine was a 0.06 second time finish. This was, this was rough and really it shouldn't be this difficult. However, besides the cluster of trials, which again, you can look up guides on how to complete, you don't have to really engage with Blitzball or the Chocobo Racing past the mandatory sections, which are very brief and not that bad. So overall, this really didn't affect my playthrough much at all. And if you're not gonna do the end game, you don't really have to worry about this. But if you do wanna engage with the end game, you're gonna have to do all these. This is your story. Spoilers. All right, I want to switch it up for a little bit and talk about the full story of this game because I think it's really special. So this is going to be the spoiler section. So if you don't want to be spoiled, skip to this timestamp now. All right, so this is Titus' story because he's a dream. How wild is that? But let me start from the beginning. So as I mentioned in the plot and story section, in the beginning of the game, you see Titus get swept away from his home in Xanarkin to Besaid, assumingly a thousand years in the future. That's what you see and think happens in these moments anyway. But what actually happened is in the very beginning of the game, where Titus seemingly gets taken by Sin, he's actually killed by Sin. He dies in the opening of this game. So what's going on with the rest of the game? How are we playing as him throughout the game if he's dead? Well, in the world of Final Fantasy X, if you don't accept death, or if a special someone wants to bring you back from death, you can come back to the world of Spira, but not as a living entity anyway. For Titus, he's being summoned back to life by Yu Yevin, which we'll talk about a little bit later, as a dream of Xanarkin. And the reason Titus is one of the ones that's brought back because his father, Jet, willed it into being so. See, Jet is the new Sin, and Yu Yevin is also Sin. So they've combined to make the creature that you encounter throughout the game, past the opening section anyway, which is the new Sin. But what is Sin? And why keep the memory of Xanarkin alive as a dream? Sin's an Aeon being summoned by the first and most powerful summoner, Yu Yevin. Sin was created in Titus' time as a weapon of mass destruction in the war between Bevel and Xanarkin. And Sin does a very good job at this, and ends up destroying Xanarkin and his people, including Titus. Fast forward a thousand years, we now have Titus in a spirit that's being tormented by Sin, which is none other than his father Jet. But how is Titus there exactly? Again, Titus is a dream of Xanarkin that is being created by a conglomerate of faith that's being used by Yu Yevin to keep the memory of Xanarkin alive. The faith, F-A-Y-T-H, are people, or in this case, a large group of people, that sacrifice himself in order to be turned into a creature that can be summoned, such as an Aeon, or in this case, the Grand City of Xanarkin. So this is the power that brought Titus back to Spira, but again, not as a living individual, but as a dream. And again, it's specifically Titus, because Jet, who's now the new Sin, and also his father, brought him here to kill Sin, thus killing Jet, and ending the cycle of never-ending death. Jet, who was also killed by Sin, was brought back 10 years earlier than the future spirit that Titus goes to, and Jet teams up with Lord Braska in a 10 year younger version of Sir Orin in Lord Braska's pilgrimage to defeat Sin, which they accomplish. But again, they don't fully kill Sin, they just beat him. See, for the past 1,000 years, no one's ever figured out how to fully kill Sin. They can only beat it, which sits up in the calm for the next 10 years. So for that time period, Sin just doesn't appear. But after that 10 years, Sin re-emerges and continues to terrorize. But since this is all they know, the calm is the best option for the people of Spira, and at least gives them some time of peace. So to them, it's worth it. But why does this really happen? Why is there a 10 year period where Sin is no more? Most people in Spira have no idea what Sin actually is, or why it shows up at certain places, and why it can't be fully killed, or what the calm really is either. Most people follow Yevon, which is the faith, F-A-I-T-H, and believe that Sin is a manifestation of our sins from relying on Machina. Or, they're outcasts that want to go against these teachings and use Machina to improve their daily lives, like the Albed. But even these people don't understand what Sin actually is, or how it functions. And since the beliefs of Yevon are that Machina is what created Sin, and what Sin seeks out, they can easily blame the Albed for the existence of sin. But the maesters of Yevon do know the truth of sin, and they've been hiding the truth from the people because they believe that this is the best option. And honestly, it kind of is. The maesters know that sin is an Aeon, made by Yu Yevon as a weapon of mass destruction, and they've also found out a way to beat it, but they can't figure out how to kill it. So naturally, they believe that it's immortal. And that way to beat it is the summoner's pilgrimage in the final Aeon. The pilgrimage is designed to have the summoner go throughout Spira, collect all the Aeons, or at least most of them, become more powerful, and then summon the final Aeon. 
but the final Aeon is in a normal Aeon, and most people don't know about this either, except for the Maesters. The final Aeon is one of the Summoner's Guardians that sacrifices themselves to become that final Aeon. And again, this isn't disclosed to the Summoners until they reach the end of their pilgrimage. However, they do know, after they summon the final Aeon, the Summoners die from the strain of the summoning. But we and Titus don't know this until essentially the last third of the game, if not even further on in the game, which is a wonderful twist and adds a lot to the mystery of the game. But what happens when Sin's defeated? When the final Aeon is summoned, the summoner dies and Sin is defeated. Then the final Aeon becomes the new Sin 10 years later. The 10 years is the time that Yu Yevin needs to conjure up the new Sin from the final Aeon. This is why Sin always comes back. Yu Yevin possesses the final Aeon and transforms them into the new Sin over a 10 year period or so. This is what the calm actually is. And again, the crazy thing is, the Maesters of Yevin know this, and they chose to hide it from everybody, and they actually use a bit of Machina to improve their own lives. But again, this kind of makes sense because even their knowledge of it assumes that Sin is immortal. So to them, they think that this is the right thing to do. But is Sin actually immortal? When Yuna and the crew make it to the end of the pilgrimage, Titus not only learns that he is a dream of Xanarkin, but Yuna refuses Yuna Leska, which was the first summoner to defeat Sin, and Yuna does not sacrifice any of her guardians so that she can obtain the final Aeon. This of course sparks a fight with Yuna Leska, and after defeating Yuna Leska, she gets sent to the far plane, and we lose the harbinger of the final Aeon, so no more final Aeons can be created. Thus, this destroys the only known way to defeat Sin. But, after defeating Unaleska, the crews determined to find a way to end this once and for all. Shortly after this, they run into the Faith of Bahamut, who speaks to Yuna and Titus, and tells them that Yu Yevin has morphed into an entity of sorts, and is not necessarily aware of what he's doing. He simply only has survival instincts, and continues to possess the final Aeon, and recreate Sin, so that he can live inside Sin safely, and survive. So, if the crew can get into Sin, and defeat Sin from within, and then stop Yu Yevin from possessing the final Aeon, or any Aeons, and defeat Yu Yevin, Sin won't be recreated, which is of course what they end up doing and defeat Sin forever. But since Yu Yevin's gone, this also means that the memory of Xanarkin is going to disappear, so Titus will fade away with the Xanarkin. As the dream's ending, and Titus begins to fade, he tries to make a quick exit when Yuna stops him and confesses her love for him as he embraces her. Titus then joins the far plane with Lord Braska, Sir Orin, and of course his father Jeth, who he now has made peace with. What a wonderful story this is, and with great twists. I'm obviously skipping over a lot, but I really just wanted to hit on all the main points and really talk about the brilliance of this plot. The voice acting and some of the lines here are a bit funky at times, but there's reasons for this I'll talk about in another section at the end of the video. But I just wanted to spend a little bit of time on a couple other topics really quick in regards to the relationships in this game and how they impact the story. The Relationships the first and most obvious one to talk about is, of course, Titus and Yuna. This is a wonderful romantic relationship, and it's very believable. There are so many good moments throughout the story that display these two getting closer and closer to each other and falling more and more in love, with the obvious scene at Makalania Lake where they had their first kiss, but also at Xanarkin when Titus puts his hand on Yuna's shoulder and she leans into him, embracing his touch, and of course the most important scene at the end of the game where Yuna tells him that she loves him and he embraces her. This is a wonderful love story, and it really added a lot to the story overall. But with any love story, you have to have something that's going to try and ruin it. And that something is, of course, Seymour. Seymour is a really interesting and atypical villain in a sense. Or at least it was at the time of the game's release. He comes off as a very proper and powerful individual, which he is. But the assumption is that he's also good because he has the title of Maester, along with all the things that he's achieved, such as being a summoner. However, even after the first meeting with him, you as the player sense that something's off, and the crew kind of notices this too. Throughout the journey, he shows up a couple of times, and then proposes a marriage between himself and Yuna. Tedious obviously doesn't like this, and really Yuna and the rest of the crew don't either, but they see this marriage as an opportunity to bring joy to Spira by seeing these two prominent figures get together. So she considers it for a time, and certainly is not emotionally invested in this, but she ultimately decides to take him up on the offer. But really she does this in order to confront him about murdering his father. She discovers this information by finding a message that his father left behind, warning whoever found the message about his son and how he was going to take his life. After Seymour is confronted, he basically admits to it. He doesn't even try to hide it. He's truly convinced that this life is a meaningless existence, and he's obsessed with ascending to a higher level of being, which I'll talk more about in just a second. But at this confrontation, Yuna and the crew kill him, so his journey to get to a higher being ends there. Or does it? Later on in the story, you run into Seymour again, and again he's trying to marry Yuna, but this time in an official wedding in Bavilla, which is the capital of Yemen. But how can this be? The crew ended him back in Guadalajara, which is his home, right? Well, he's an unsaid. His attachment to this world is so strong, and he was already very powerful, that when you put those two together, and the fact that he refused death, this kept him here in spirit. 
So Yuno plays along with this wedding ceremony in order to get a chance to ultimately send Seymour to the far plane, which is essentially the place you go to when you die. Which is also what summoners do for people that meet an untimely end so that they don't stay attached to spirit, which for people that aren't powerful end up becoming fiends. But in this case, because Seymour is so powerful and his attachment to spirit is so strong, he stays in his physical form. But again, Yuna is determined to fix that. So you battle Seymour again, but this time he's a little bit more powerful, but again you still best him. But the crew has to escape the scene before Yuna gets a chance to send him. This is also where we learn his real intentions, which are to help Sin in destroying the world and ridding the world of the burden of life and freeing everyone with death. Now he's really starting to turn into a deranged villain. But then again, in a world terrorized by Sin, this makes a lot of sense in that seeking death would release one from the torment that Sin brings, but it's still unhinged and definitely cynical in nature. They then run into him again at the top of Mount Gagazet, where he's become even more of a villain, and he explains that he's killed the rest of Pomari's people on his way to the top of the mountain to capture Yuna. Where again, of course, he's bested, and then we meet him one more time inside of Sin, where he's been taken in by Sin, which consequently further pushes his narrative towards becoming more powerful and releasing everyone from this existence on Spira. But of course, we end up beating him for the final time, and he's sent to the far plane by Yuna. Seymour is a really good villain by the end of the game, and I think has pretty strong motives to do what he does, although definitely not right or good by any means. I don't think he thinks he's evil, but just that this existence on Spira is so terrible to deal with because of Sin that it's just not worth the pain and the suffering. So the only way out for him is to end this existence for everyone. So he sees it as saving everyone. Also, the deal with his mother sacrificing herself to become his Aeon during his pilgrimage is so wild, but also really good. She wanted to protect her son because he's a bit of an outcast because he's half human and half Guado. So she sacrifices himself and becomes a powerful tool for him to use on his pilgrimage. And as Anima, which is essentially Seymour's Aeon, she's extremely powerful and one of the most powerful Aeons. And the design of this Aeon and the moveset and everything about this Aeon really represents what Seymour's having to deal with by losing his mother to this pilgrimage and dealing with Sin as a whole which of course is pain. Such a good adjunct to its character. Another really interesting relationship is with Waka and the Albed. Now this is a spicy one. So Waka is basically a super racist to the Albed. That's because he believes that the Albed's not only causing Sin to show up more, but also what's keeping it alive. So he believes that Albed's responsible for this, and he also believes that the Albed is also responsible for the death of his brother Chapu, because Chapu used Machina to fight Sin in the battle where he died at. There's a lot of moments, especially early on, where Waka is kind of out of pocket with saying some super racist stuff towards the Albed. And you can tell really the rest of the party doesn't agree with this, but they also don't want to get anything started with him either. So they just kind of let it slide. But I will say, Titus does speak up from time to time and I think that does a lot for Titus's character as well. And really these beliefs are kind of rooted in the teachings of Yevon, which basically state that Machina is strictly forbidden and indirectly the Albed go directly against this and use Machina exclusively. So in the world of Spira, there's really a decent amount of people that are kind of racist to the Albed. Even as you're playing the game, the Albed are initially presented as the bad guys in a sense, or at least they're not good people, which is really crazy and unhinged. But then you meet Riku, who's definitely an Albed, but she's super sweet, very helpful and very caring. And as the game progresses, the layers of misinformation about the Albed start to be peeled back and you learn more about them and come to terms that this is just a misunderstood group of people. And most importantly, Walker learns this too. And even apologizes to Sid, who's Riku's dad, and also Yuna's uncle, for being so racist towards their people. This is absolutely wonderful character development. And finally, let's talk about the relationship between Titus, Orin, and Jet. So Titus hates his father Jet, but that's because he sees his dad as someone that was particularly mean to him when he was around and for most part of his life wasn't around. But is this really true? So he absolutely wasn't around, but that's because he was killed by sin. And Titus doesn't learn that until he gets to spirit. And he was mean, but what he was trying to do is make his son stronger because his son was very sensitive and emotional, and he was trying to push him towards success, although his means were ill-guided. However, when Jet becomes a guardian of Lord Braska, he realizes his mistakes in treating his son like this. And now he just wishes to get back home and redeem himself, which he can't. So when Lord Braska and his guardians decide to make the final Aeon, Jet volunteers in a way to somewhat redeem himself for his misdeeds. He's trying to do a last little bit of good for the people of Spira now that he understands that he won't ever be able to get back to Xanarkin. And thus he won't be able to see Titus or Titus's mother and also his wife. And during this, he tells Orin to watch over his son, and then Jet becomes the final Aeon. When they get to Sin, Lord Braska summons him, and of course dies doing so, and then Jet defeats Sin, and then becomes the new Sin. Orin is the only one to live through this battle. Before getting into this, Orin urges them not to follow through with it, and Jet seconds that opinion, but Lord Braska is determined, and both follow him to his end. 
So as his loyal guardian, Orin bears the burden of being the only survivor of this fight and losing both of his friends to this endless cycle of death. Plagued by the Survivor's Guild and infuriated by the upholding of the pilgrimage in the final Aeon Summoning, Orin goes back to Unaleska, who's the catalyst for the final Aeon Summoning, and tries to defeat her. In doing so, Orin is struck down and meets his end here. But how is it possible that he's a guardian for Yuna? Well, he's also an unsent. Orin's attachment to this world was so strong due to his hatred of the pilgrimage and primarily for his duty to follow through with the last request of Jet looking after his son Titus. So since Orin is still here on Spira during Yuna's timeline, he waits until he can come in contact with Sin again to get inside of Sin and join with it, thus being able to travel back in time to the original Sin, which is in Titus's timeline. But because everything's interconnected, Sin is now Jet through Orin Orin joining Jet, Jet informs Orin that he wants Titus to be brought to Yuna's timeline and he needs Titus to defeat him and stop this in the cycle once for all. So during the time that Jet disappeared from Titus' life to the time that Titus dies by the hand of Sin, Orin looks out for Titus from afar and at times checks up on him to make sure that he's okay. But when Sin arrives in Xanarkin, Orin leads Titus to Sin so that Titus can be touched by Sin and be brought back as a dream in Yuna's timeline. And even as they're both about to be taken in by Sin, Orin looks up to Sin and asks, You are sure? Basically asking Jet in the future that he's sure that he wants Titus to do this, as Jet is connected to Sin throughout time now, and that he's the most current Sin. Then Orin becomes a part of Sin again, and Titus dies, only to be brought back as a dream a thousand years later in Yuna's timeline, along with Orin. I absolutely love the dynamic of these three. I love that Titus hates his dad, initially anyway, due to him thinking that his dad left him and his mother, and the only memories that he has of his dad is his dad being tough on him. I love that Titus finds out more information that gives him greater context into what his dad was trying to do for him, and seeing that his dad was a very flawed individual, and that he's tried to redeem himself. I love that he learns just how much his dad grew during the time in Spira with Lord Braska and Sir Orin, and just how much his dad actually cared about him. I love that Orin doesn't like Jet to begin with and really doesn't want him to join the pilgrimage, but after the time that they spend together throughout the journey, they befriend each other and Orin ends up having a ton of respect for him by the end and he loyally follows through with Jet's last wish and sees it complete by looking after Titus and helping him grow. And I really love how Titus comes to peace with all this at the end and forgives his father when he ends up going to the far plane. This is an excellent payoff for all of the buildup around these three. The end game. Okay, so now I want to switch it up again and talk about the end game for Final Fantasy X because honestly, it's pretty impressive. So, after you get access to the airship right before you fight Sin, you get access to most of the end game, and right before the final fight, you have all the end game available to you. The end game includes the super weapons for each character, which are the celestial weapons, three optional Aeons, eight dark Aeons to fight, which are super difficult and challenging, the monster arena, where you can capture each monster type from each area and unlock a super monster from that area to be fought, four crazy super bosses that are really challenging and tough, and a really tough in-game area that houses two out of the four super crazy in-game bosses. If you were to do all of these, it would easily double your playtime, which would probably be equivalent to like 100 to 120 hours or so. Also, some of the super bosses and the dark aeons are just really, really tough to beat, so you better come to these fights really prepared. They're much harder than the final boss of this game. And I've already talked about the celestial weapons, so I won't repeat that, but the optional aeons are also tied to some of the celestial weapons, so it's a hit or miss on the difficulty of obtaining them. And the super monsters from each area are also really tough and pretty fun to fight. And the end game area with the two crazy super bosses is like the ultimate challenge for a Final Fantasy X lover and really enjoyable. So the end game overall is just really exceptional. Final Fantasy X Remake? So some of the things that I kept having run through my mind when I was playing this game was, man, this would be so much better in a modern day version of this, or man, some of the dialogue could have used a bit of an update, or dang, some of these side quests and in-game activities just aren't particularly fun and pretty difficult for the sake of being difficult in some of the most annoying ways. And the follow-up to these thoughts was, of course, what would a remake look like? I feel like this game, more so than any other game that I've done a video on in this channel, would do exceptionally well with a remake. But the question is, of course, should there be a Final Fantasy VII remake style? remake of this game or should they just basically update the graphics and update some of the script and voice lines and whatnot and make a modern day version of this game well in my opinion I think this is one of the best turn-based battle systems to date, and I would love for the battle system just to say the same. But there's also a good argument for updating the system to something like Final Fantasy VII Remake or even a Final Fantasy XVI style battle system to modernize it a little bit more. To which I don't necessarily disagree with either, because I do think that this cast of characters, the story, the world, and the lore are really super interesting and would do very well if it was introduced to a new audience properly. But again, I love this turn-based battle system, so I'd probably prefer to keep that, but I'm good with either or. However, if they were to keep the battle system, 
they really need to update the menu system because boy oh boy this menu system does not look good nor is it particularly useful for item organization or management graphically this game still looks pretty good but unlike final fantasy 13 which is also an older title at this point final fantasy 10 even in the hd version is really starting to show its age especially with the in-game models primarily because there's very little facial expressions throughout the story and i think that if they added facial expressions in a lot of the scenes that would have made those scenes much more impactful and more fleshed out along with this there's also some dialogue that's either just not done well or it's rushed in order for the scene to conclude on time because there wasn't a separate version for the english voiceover and the japanese voiceover so essentially the English voiceover is literally just a voiceover, the Japanese version of it. So the speed of the line, the timing, the lip syncing, and the tint behind the dialogue is a bit lost in translation here. Also the script could get a bit of an update too to appropriately integrate it into more of a modern take where dialogue kind of flows a little bit more naturally instead of maybe necessarily literal direct translations of things. Which again, not all the game does. At the very end of the Japanese version, Yuna says thank you instead of I love you. And I think the English version is way better. But I think with some of these changes, it would do wonders for a new version of this game. And finally, let's talk about some gameplay updates that would be great. Personally, I think that changing the encounter system to something more akin to Final Fantasy XIII's encounter system, where enemies are visible and you have to run into them, would be excellent. Obviously, an update to the controls and how you maneuver would also be nice, but more importantly, I think that changing the controls in some of the mini games wouldn't just be nice, but necessary. The chocobo races, the butterfly mini game, the lightning dodging mini game either need to have their control schemes updated or just completely scrapped as a whole. Along with this, Blitzball should also be updated. I think that changing Blitzball to more of a FIFA-like game instead of an RPG would be a great update because that naturally seems like how Blitzball would be played. And for the Cloister of Trials, really I think all of them need to be completely reworked to some Something totally new to where the encounters are more interesting and fun as a whole. I think some of these changes would really do a great job at giving this title another breath of life. And honestly, I think a remake of this game would do pretty well. But let me know what you think in the comments and tell me what you would change or update in a remake. Conclusion. Final Fantasy X is without a doubt a classic that definitely deserves your time. The story and plot are wonderful overall, the battle system is the best turn-based battle system the series has ever seen, the world of Spira and the lore is super interesting, it has what I think to be the second best soundtrack in the series, and it has the best leveling system in the series with the Sphere Grid, along with a dense and mostly super fun endgame that is very challenging. However, it does start to show its age with some of its graphics, it has some very annoying gameplay sections, along with very annoying mini-games, the dialogue can be a bit funky at times with poor lip sync which all of these can be dealt with with a remake. Yet most of the annoying sections of this game can be avoided, if you so choose. And most of the other negative aspects of this game truly don't impact the overall experience enough for one to turn away from the title. The battling system, the leveling system, the music, and the story will hopefully make you fall in love with this Final Fantasy title the way that I have if you aren't already there. This is certainly one of the best Final Fantasy titles and is unquestionably worth playing today. If you liked the video and you want to see more like this, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, hit the bell notification, that way you don't miss out on any future videos, and leave a comment and tell me what you thought about the video or what you'd like to see me do next. Again, thank you all for the support. I really appreciate each and every one of you. I love seeing what you all think about the video and your opinions on the game in the comments. I think next up for me is actually going to be something a little different, so stay tuned for that. Also, we passed 1.5k subscribers, so thank you all so much for that, and I really do appreciate it. Also, if you want to help support the channel a little bit further, consider becoming a member, or you'll get extra loyalty badges, emojis for comments, and a shout out in my next video. But until then, I wish you all the very best, and hope you enjoy. Bye-bye!